let's just, let's just lift our hands. Just stay here a moment longer. Fill us up. Fill us up. We are tired of trying to do this thing half filled. Fill us up. Cups that run over. God, get us today into an overflow dimension. Get us today into a dimension that is without limit. Fill us up. We're not going to settle for something less than that today. Fill us up. Barre baba ba ko mandolo atadi di anda da mele berre be etele bi bi ando bosto bare di anda mo ko tale bi andi di di itele bi anda ba ve borro bo tota etele bi asto etele bi asto etele bi asto bo robanda da mi ko bo vre be be iti bi ando be vro baba ba so baba ka mindolo baba baba ko no more half heartedness. But when you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. No more half-heartedness. No more divided focus. No other lovers from this day forward. God says I'm giving grace for you to focus completely on my face. Not to look to the left and not to look to the right. Your gaze is too quickly stolen, says God. Your gaze has been too quickly stolen. And you've turned away to other affections. You've turned away to other attractions. And you've run away with lesser lovers. But today I'm saying, come back, come back, come back. And seek me with your full heart. For it is there that you'll find the treasure that you've been looking for. For it is there that you'll find the fulfillment that you've been looking for. For it is there that you'll step into the dimension of overflow. No more half-heartedness. But you will from this day forward inherit a grace to seek me with the fullness of your heart. No more distractions. No more side issues. No more loss of focus. But I declare a direct vision, a clear insight into the dimension of heaven this day in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we receive of the grace today to seek you with all of our heart. The whole thing. The whole of our heart. Seeking the whole of your heart. In Jesus' name. Why don't you try to find a spot to sit and move up and in as close as you will. There's no reason for anybody to be way back, 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 back today. Scoot in real close. We're going to just share a little while. Danny, why don't you just keep playing right there for, for me for a minute, man. I usually shut that 
off, but I just, there's some things I think the Father wants to say out of this. Yeah. Hallelujah. I was going to share with you a little while, and I don't know how far I'll go, but some things that I'm learning about the presence of the Lord. One of the reasons that people don't place necessary value on what God just did in here in the last 45 minutes is because most of you had nothing to do with getting it here. And if you did, you'd value it. If you did, you'd celebrate it. But it, it took a tremendous individual anointing to open a portal today. This is not, I know we're taping this and whatever. I don't I guess I really care. But I don't mean this derogatory toward anybody. But because we had people that were younger in the anointing last night, they couldn't open it for you. And you sure don't know how to open it for yourself. And this is the reason that the church at large lives paralyzed in codependence. Waiting for somebody to come break the dam for you. And this is going to paralyze us. It's going to cripple us. And it's going to keep us in a state of going around a mountain of immaturity. There'll come a day that this young worship team that was used in a great way, did a phenomenal job last night. They'll be able to open it for you, but I hope you won't need it. I am so tired of it taking one individual's great anointing to come do for you what would have happened for you a long time ago if you ever did this stuff in your bedroom. So we bring Akia out, and Akia shouldn't even have to do anything today. Akia should, I mean, I thank God that she did, but she shouldn't have to bring somebody that has an extraordinary personal anointing to begin to really open things up for us. We should be able to come in a meeting, and nobody touch a key, and nobody touch a drum, and nobody get up and lead you for five minutes in prayer. And when we say pray, there should be a people who lift up their voice until heaven opens, and then we could have actual worship leaders instead of cheerleaders. Now, to get you in the mood and pump you up and get you happy and get you excited and get you full of faith, you should come ready. What happens in these services should be such an overflow of what you've been experiencing at home, what you've been experiencing in your car, what you've been experiencing in your dormitory, that by the time we get here, all of this is, is is the coming together of a bunch of individual people that have been in an incredible individual place. What God did in here in the last few minutes was phenomenal. And I want you to value that, that what opened it up for us comes from a different private life than most people in the normal church are accustomed to. And I want to get the church out of that place of codependence where we come to see how God's going to use somebody else to open things up for us. I want you to be an opener. In Isaiah twenty two twenty two, the prophet declares that he's going to find a generation that he'll give the key of David that opens doors that no man can close and closes doors that no man can open. John declares it again in the book of Revelation, the key of David, that opens doors that no man can close and closes doors that no man can open. The word key there is literally translated opener. There'll be a people that God will give a grace to open. When you open heaven, healing will come. When you open heaven, revelation will come. When you open heaven, authority will come. God's looking for people that will be openers, but there is a price to be paid if you're going to have the authority that heaven opens when you speak or heaven opens when you sing or heaven opens when you you preach or pray or whatever dimension God's using you in. And I want you to place value on it. I want you to recognize that God is is not looking for a, a man. This idea that any time God wants to do anything significant in the earth, he uses a man is over. It's Old Testament. 
Whenever God got ready to do something in the Old Testament, he used a man. In the New Testament, he killed a man so he could use a body. When God wanted to release covenant into the earth, he found a man that would birth a generation. And God's not on the search right now for a singular anointing. I believe God's on the search right now for a corporate expression of his heart in the earth. Jesus came to the earth as God's only son and left the earth as God's oldest son. Unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. Jesus didn't just die to take away your sins. He died to multiply sonship. That's why the Bible says if the prince of darkness had known, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Because in crucifying Jesus, he got rid of one son. Now he has to deal with the many manifested sons of God in the earth. Jesus gave up his right to be the only one so he could become the first one so the earth could be filled with people that reflect the glory and nature of God. That's you, man. That's you. Don't just go to church. Don't just enjoy worship. Don't just follow good preaching. To understand that you can be an opener, that your purpose, whether you preach, whether you sing, whether you become a doctor, whether you become a lawyer, whether you become a president or a senator, your purpose in the earth is to open doors that no man can close, is to allow God to cause you to be the one that is willing to put yourself through the eye of the needle until you fit the keyhole and until dimensions roll back at the sound of your voice. You can be a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You don't have to be uh, somebody who enjoys watching other people be used. You can be used. And you being used doesn't mean one day you're going to get a pulpit and one day you're going to get a microphone and one day they're going to hear you play the keyboard. It means that right there from wherever you are, whatever you're doing, in whatever dimension God's called you to, that you would have an authority and a grace to cause things to open that have never opened before. What we experienced in the last few minutes needs to be something more than enjoyment. You need to see the assignment in it. And you need to say, I'm going to live the kind of life that in five minutes I can change a room. That in five minutes I can turn the tide. I remember years ago, I was in North Carolina. I'll never forget where I was. I was in Shalote, North Carolina, right outside the city of Wilmington. And I was praying. There was a couple of thousand people there, and we were in a morning meeting like this, and we just turned it into a prayer meeting. We began to pray. And we began to pray that abortion would end in America. And when we began to pray, I began to pray, turn the tide, God. Turn the tide, God. Turn the tide. Turn the tide of this issue of abortion. Take this death sentence off of America. End the genocide in America. Don't don't let another little African-American child die because daddy was too much of a punk to raise a kid. And I begin to pray, God, turn the tide. God, turn the tide. God, turn the tide. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you turn the tide. I said, no, you turn the tide. You're God. I'm Damon. You turn the tide. He said, no. He said, the sun doesn't control the tide. The moon does. He said, I'm the source of the light. You're the reflection of the light. You're responsible to control the tide. The moon is not the source of the light. The moon is the reflection of the light of the sun in an hour in which the earth is not properly aligned with the sun to see it. We stare at the light until we become the reflection that controls the tide. If the water mark in the church is not where it needs to be, it's not because God is not pouring out his spirit. It's because the people with the keys are not being openers. This city needs an opening. This city needs something to penetrate the atmosphere that causes glory to come down. It causes glory to manifest. And you can't say, go to this church. You can't say, go to this church. Revival. You can't say go to this camp meeting. You can't say go to this conference. You just say there's something over that city. It doesn't matter where you go to church. There's glory everywhere. It doesn't matter. It's not one particular place. It's, it's that heaven has opened. It's that they have received the grace for an open portal and a dimensional interruption. I believe that's what we're moving into. Thank you. Thank you for playing up there. Thank you guys for doing that. Thank you, Akia, for just coming and just doing it, just pouring 
just breaking the box. The, the interesting thing about the story of the woman with the alabaster box is she put herself in position where she had no control over the nature of the flow. And we're right now, we're too into neat. We're not going to get this next dimension until we get done with the idea that most of what God's wanting to do is not going to look good on TV. Most of what God's going to do is not going to package well. We're going to get in moments like this, and it's going to be terribly uncomfortable for those that have a casual approach to Christianity. But we're going to have to be willing to live in that place of being uncomfortable. One of the keys to living in this dimension, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about dimensions today. One of the keys to living in this dimension is the revelation that the weight is necessary. And we live in a culture that can't stand to wait for anything. Most of you under a certain age in this room have never licked a stamp in your life. You send mail by mashing buttons. But it was not that long ago that somebody took that mail, put it in a pouch, climbed on the back of a horse, and rode till they found somebody else on a horse. That was not that long ago. And what's happened is we've allowed the leaven of the culture to invade the church to the point that if anything takes more than 15 minutes and people are uncomfortable, we shut it down because it's not going to get them to come back next week. But the goal is not to get the people to come back next week. It's to get the glory to stay. If the glory stays, the people will come. And there are no shortcuts for the glory. You may shortcut your way into church growth. You may shortcut your way into getting a building paid for. You may shortcut your way into becoming a TV preacher, but you'll never shortcut your way into the glory. There are some things that have to be done the old-fashioned, inconvenient, time-consuming way. I'm analyzing the age of my crowd, so I make sure that I'm not saying anything that's inappropriate. But intimacy is best enjoyed when you're willing to go through the process of the wait. There's some things that just don't need to be rushed. I'm going to stop there. There's some things that need to percolate. There's some things that need a crock pot and not a microwave. Oh, some things you're going to have to saturate your way into. Some things you're going to have to be willing to soak. Sometimes you're going to have to be willing to come in here on a morning like this and say, we prayed for two hours, and I'm looking for pastors that will do it on Sunday morning because they'll understand that their responsibility is not to entertain, it is to equip. And when we begin to understand that our responsibility is to equip instead of entertain, then we're willing to go through the process, even if it gets on the nerves of nominal Christians that are never going to produce any significant fruit anyway we got to understand who our target audience is. Years ago, a phrase came into the church that has annoyed me to the point that it's almost made, it almost made me violent. The seeker-sensitive church. And the seeker-sensitive church was all about cutting the service down, making it shorter, making it more enjoyable for people. And if that's what you want to do, then knock yourself out. It's a total waste of your time and their time. But, I'm, but the real problem with me is you, t- you stole the term seeker. That's my real issue. Because if it was really a seeker-sensitive church, it wouldn't have a shorter service. It would have a longer service. If the service was really sensitive to the seeker, see, that's the problem is you're calling people seekers that are not seekers. Seekers want to change. Seekers want to go through the process of transformation. Seekers say, I want to stay here all day if I have to, but I do not want to leave the same as I was when I came into the building. So if you really begin to build ministry for seekers, it's going to be annoying to people in the beginning, but we've got to be willing to go through the process of attracting the glory of God, even if it means that we're not popular to people for a little while. And I want to get this in the DNA of the wave. I want to get this in the DNA of the seekers that God is going to begin to join together in this region. That I see what I see coming, and we haven't talked a lot of vision, 
But I see gatherings for this region coming together. And, it's, and, and I see multiple churches participating. I see numerous youth groups participating. And people coming together and they say, well, what are we there for? We're just here for the glory of God. We just believe that God wants to do something in an area, not in a particular ministry, not in a particular church, not in, under a particular man, but a gathering of people that would come together like the early church came together in the upper room and not deal with who's in charge and not deal with who's going get the credit and not deal with whether this looks like the way we've done it in the past, but just come together and say, we're going to take a couple of days, hallelujah, and we're going to bring our families into the presence of God, and we're going to seek God while he may be found. And if one has a song, they'll sing it. If one has a word of exhortation, they'll bring it. And we could actually start making this thing look like the Bible church instead of the America church if somebody was willing to get over their ego. God's going to do this, and I want, to, I want to get you off this fast food email, give it to me quick version of Christianity. And I want to teach you that there is a glory in waiting. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not go real. They'll walk and not faint. You have need of endurance. So that after you've done the will of God, you may be able to obtain the promise. There is a significant gap between doing the will of God and obtaining the promise, and most people quit in the gap. Because we don't like endurance. Hupomenio, it's the Greek word, to bear up under the load of a thing. When he said you have need of endurance, he said, I want to put a weight on you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want you to be able to bear up under the weight, and I want you to be able to stay the course. I want you to be able to carry a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. But make no mistake, it is a yoke and it is a burden. Somebody's going to demonstrate to this nation, we were talking on the way home last night, that once you've tasted a genuine glory, You may, for the benefit of your ministry, produce a counterfeit, but deep inside you, when you lay your head on your pillow at night, you know that's not the same thing I felt back then. You may muster it up. You may work it up. You may hype it up. You may hoop it up, but you're going to know that's not the same thing that moved in there that rocked me to the core of my being. That's what God wants to do here. I'm convinced that God is looking for places looking for hot spots. He's looking for hubs. And I'm convinced that he does not care if there's five or five million. He's looking for seekers. Malachi 3 verse 1 says, And suddenly the Lord whom you seek will visit his temple. His suddenlies will follow your every days, but somebody's going to have to be willing to do this every day. God's looking for consistency. He's looking for endurance. He's looking for discipline because every one of these are consequences of hunger. When I, when I initially asked my wife to go out with me the first time, she said no the first three times. I got three sisters. They were all convinced that she would marry me because that I would marry her because she told me no. That there was something fascinating about something being good enough that I was going to go after it even when it looked like it was impossible. Why would God shroud himself in the mystery? The Greeks called it the mysterion. Why would God shroud himself in the mystery of his presence? Because God has no desire to reveal himself to anybody that is approaching him with a common gaze. It's not that God doesn't want you to find him. It's that he doesn't want it to be cheap. So when you seek God for five minutes, you don't find him. And when you seek God three days out of the month, you don't find him. And when you seek God during the special conference and then ignore him until the next special conference, you're never going to find him. It's not that he doesn't want you to find him. It's that he wants you to understand that he is the treasure that is hidden in a field that when a man finds it, he'll sell everything he has to buy it. Listen, not to buy the treasure. 
You had to buy the field. The field is full of dirt and rocks and weeds. The field equates itself to labor. And the man couldn't just go by the prize. He had to go by the field. That means you're going to have to do the dirty part too. It's not enough for you to want to be in the ministry and called to preach and got an anointing. No, man. It, there are, listen, there are people living under a bridge that are more talented than anybody in this room. Out preach us all, out sing us all. There is somebody sticking a heroin needle in their vein right now with a five octave range that would set this room on its ear. God's not looking for talent. Hear this, friend. God is looking for people who appreciate the endurance that is necessary to go through the process, and they will wait. They will wait. If Jesus could hold his supernatural DNA for 30 years, oh, my God. Can you imagine at 17 walking around with the revelation that you're the son of God and the Bible would say the father loves the son and hath given unto him the spirit that is without measure with the exceeding great revelation that you could raise the dead and having to go to funerals, sit there, know you could fix it, but not because you knew your time hadn't come yet. God's looking for people that understand the process, that this is not a microwave And if America is going to get back to a true third great awakening dimension of the glory of God, it's going to be because God finds Jacob, the generation who will seek my face. Let me throw a theory at you. I'm being being careful here. Matt, cover your ears over here because this is not theologically sound enough for you, Matt. Sitting over there with his master's degree from Asbury Theological Seminary. It's intimidating to talk in front of him. Theory, okay? The Bible said Jacob was alone and he wrestled with a man. Maybe we have made that man God too fast. Because that's a theory. If you're alone and you wrestle with a man, I got some thinkers in here, I can tell. If you're alone and you wrestle with a man, could it be that Jacob was struggling with Israel? Could it be that the real wrestling match of our lives is not between us and God? Could it be the real wrestling match is between us and our intended nature? The self that is and the man that I'm really supposed to be are wrestling back and forth, trying to determine, am I going to be trickster or am I going to be the nation that God exalts above every other nation in the earth? And there's a continually, whoo, I feel the anointing. So it might be more than a theory now because I feel something on it, you know. Give me the witness of the Holy Ghost between my shoulder blades and I'll write a book on it right now. Jacob was alone and he wrestled with a man. There's a limp that comes when you surrender to your new nature that forever changes the way you walk. But there's something inside of you that desires to be predominant. There's something in you that's not lazy. There's something in you that's not self-involved. There's something in you that's not egotistical. There's something in you that's not full of envy and arrogance and pride and a desire to tear other people down so you can exalt yourself above them. There's something of humility in you, but it's so difficult to get that thing to surface. And I have found that the greatest place to allow your intended self to dominate over your current self is when you sit in that glory. You say, I'm not getting up until you change me. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not giving you 30 minutes. I'm not giving you 45 minutes. I'm shutting everything off. And if this takes as long as it takes. One of my friends that God gave me years ago, just we're weird enough to get along, is a lady by the name of Heidi Baker. And Heidi Baker had an encounter with God, and when she had an encounter with God, she didn't leave her room for 10 days. She didn't leave her room for 10 days. And I can remember hearing that story and thinking, God, I want, I want to have an encounter like that. He said, why? You wouldn't give me 10 days. 
I know y'all would. Y'all so holy in here. I'm in here with all Jesus' second cousins this morning. I thank y'all for coming. The church is crying out, God give us revival. And he's saying, why? You wouldn't rearrange T-ball for it. Give us revival. God's saying, I know what you would do with it if I sent it to you. You'd try to fit it into your American dream package. And revival doesn't fit there. Revival doesn't come and visit and accompany and become an accoutrement or an accessory. The revival comes and takes over. When you get touched by the real glory of God, it's not your Sunday and your Wednesday anymore. It's your obsession. It's the purpose of your existence. It's the passion for which you breathe. And I believe God's locating a people in this Columbus area that are not going to settle for the hype and you're not going to settle for the entertainment and you're not going to settle for what looks good on TV. You want to weep. And know that it's not coming out of just your emotions and your flesh. It's coming out of a deep place in you. I've shouted and I've hooped and I've danced and I've hit them on the two and the four and got the ham and B3 wailing in the back and I love every bit of it. But the moments that have changed me have not been the moments I was hooping, shouting, and hucking and bucking. They've been the moments when I couldn't pick myself up out of the floor and I didn't understand where one more tear could possibly come out of me. And we embarked on that journey for a while this morning. We went there for a moment this morning. But I want you to understand that you can go there more than when this conference is going on. You can live in that place where you get on your knee and you cry out to your God and nobody has a microphone and you're not in a church building, but you're crying out where deep cries out to deep. I just wanted this morning, I, I, there's some more things that I could share with you, and I, I'm really going to pick up on this and, and go deep in this tonight. I'm going to do something tonight I have never done in a conference like this. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to tonight, by the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to mark people that will accept the grace to, to come under the grace for the seeker lifestyle. I've never done that in a gathering like this, but I'm going to mark people tonight. God, we thought we would baptize today, and I heard the Lord say, don't baptize them, mark them. Mark people, and I'm going to do this tonight, and I'm going to share some more things with you. And if you will say yes to the grace to it, I'm going to invite you into the greatest inconvenience you could ever experience in 10,000 lifetimes, the inconvenience of God wrecking you, man. The inconvenience of you giving up on the wrestling match and saying, I'm tired of being trickster. I want to be Israel. We gotta learn to wait. We gotta quit packaging and marketing and asking ourselves, will they like this? We gotta start asking ourselves, do you like it? It's his house. And we come into his house to see what he can do for us. And sometimes we need to come see what we can do for him. What do you want? What do you want, God? We don't even deserve to be here, but since we're here, what can we give you? David said, what can I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? He starts digging around and looking for something in his possession that is appropriate enough to give to God that has laden him with extravagant benefits. I want to tell you, that what you experienced in this room today, you can experience in your bedroom on a Monday night. And if you ever learn to experience it there, then you can do what happened for us today. You can open it up in a room like this. But God is so tired of imposters and posers and counterfeit artists who try to be something up here that they're not when they're at home, that he's going to Search the earth. One of the only times the Bible ever says God looked for anything, he looked for a seeker. Let me just show you this. Can I, can I take a few more minutes and show you this? I know it's getting kind of late, but whatever. You know, I'm not here but one day, and then I got to leave, so I want to give you everything I got while I'm here. Are you okay with that? Good. Seven of you are. Praise God for all of you. 
One of the only times in the Bible it ever says God looked for anything, he looked for a seeker. Remember when Jesus encounters the woman at the well? And she says, my, my people worship on this mountain, your people worship on that mountain. And Jesus said, your people worship, they know not what. But the hour cometh and that hour is now that they that worship him must worship him. Akia started singing this this morning in spirit and in truth. Watch this next part. The Father seeketh such as to worship him. The Bible said the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro about the earth, seeking someone he can show himself strong through. This is what heaven is looking for. God does not listen to, to I'll use myself as an example, not in arrogance, but just because I'm gonna, I'll pick on me instead of you. God doesn't listen to me speak and go, mm, boy, we made a great preacher. God's looking and saying, is he broken enough for us to flow through? The test of my assignment is not eloquence. The, the test of my assignment is not intellect. The test of my assignment is not revelation. The test of my assignment is not can I project my voice. The test of my assignment is not do I know how to work a crowd. The test of my assignment is has God discovered enough brokenness in me that he says when we pour it in him, it will always get through him. God's not looking for singers. He's not looking for preachers. He's looking for brokenness. And when he finds it, he'll pour himself in you. I have never found a broken man have to ask for the anointing. I've never found a broken man that had to beg for God to build his church. I've never found a broken man that had to beg for God to take care of his marriage. I've never found a broken man that had to beg for God to save his kids. If God can find brokenness, he will make an investment of glory in you because he knows it won't stay in you. You won't get credit for it. People won't worship you and people won't rally around you. They'll be drawn to you because of what pours through you. God, if you're going to touch us, touch us with brokenness. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. God will not deny. That word despise. God won't turn away from anybody that is operating in true brokenness. And I'm telling you, it's at that cross. It's in those moments of worship. It's in that place, the depths of God, where your flesh doesn't want to, and you've been here too long, and your mind is wandering, and something rises up on the inside of you and says, I will stay in this river. David goes and gets, I know I'm just talking. Is this okay? I'm just, just, I just want to share. David goes in the river and finds five smooth stones. I think it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He goes into the river and he finds five smooth stones. He picks the five stones that have gone through the process of wading in the water to the point that they'll fly straight. There are too many people that are flying off over here and flying off over there and can't stay on course and can't keep the right track and they start in the right direction but after the wind starts to blow, they start to tail to the left or to the right. And God's looking for people that say, I will stay in the river until every rough edge is knocked off of me knowing that when you release me, I will hit my target. Find the river, friend. Let it become the companion of your soul. You hear me? Find the river. <laughs> Find the deep place in God. Find that place where you lose track of time. Find that place where you forget about your to-do list. Find that place where you forget about who you hadn't called and who you hadn't texted and what all the practical things you're supposed to be doing. You find that place that your soul knows very well and you let that river become a part of the fabric of your DNA. And I'm telling you in that river, God will begin to knock things off of you that would never happen with you taking notes in a hundred church services. Services. There's some things God's not going to fix until you get alone with him. I thank God for the preaching of the gospel. I think there's no more powerful tool to introduce people to God, but I don't think it's as powerful a discipleship tool as the river. Preaching is the God's greatest gift to bring people into a state of awakening, but I'm telling you, worship and prayer are God's greatest gift to get people into maturity. We've made everything revolve around the pulpit and everything revolve around the stage and God's looking for somebody that'll go in the closet, shut the door and say, I'm not coming out until I'm changed. 
I hope this is hitting you today. I hope you don't see that I'm talking down to you today. I hope this is hitting you deep in your spirit and something inside of you is going, man, as soon as this thing is over, I'm going to find somewhere where I can get with God and I'm going to fix this inconsistency in my personal devotion life and I'm going to become a man of prayer before I become a man of the pulpit and I'm going to become a woman of intercession before I ever try to be a worship leader. I'm going to be deep in the things of God. I'm going to let God mark me. I'm going to let God mar me. I'm going to let God refashion me into the vessel he intended for me to be. I'm going to go through the process of brokenness. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to be a phony. I'm not going to be a poser. I'm not going to be an imposter. I'm not going to play a role on a stage. I'm not going to play a role with a microphone. I'm going to be the real thing. If i got to be the real thing by myself, I'm going to be the real thing. man. You might not like me, but I am what I am. I am what I am. I don't know how to be anything different. I don't mean this. Woo. I, listen, you get so broken, you can't put up a front. You get so broken, your arm can't pick up the mask anymore. A.W. Tozer said, God rescues us by breaking us. Thus saving us for himself. Some of you in here got a story that everything you depended on to get you where you thought you were going in God got kicked out from under you. I'm telling you, welcome to the club. He wants you for himself. My friend Matt sitting over here said something I wrote in my notebook and I've shared it with at least one person a day since he said it. He said, He was standing in the back of the service when I was preaching in Kentucky and God spoke to his spirit and he said, you need to thank God they rejected you. God said, you need to thank me that they rejected you because I was saving you from their system. Some of you in this room, you need to thank God you were rejected. You need to thank God that you didn't get the seat you thought you wanted. You need to thank God that you didn't stand on the pulpit that you thought you wanted to stand on. You need to thank God that he loved you too much to let you get wrapped up in the tentacles of man's agenda and religion's ideas. God, I'm telling you, I'm to the point in my life, I don't care if it's me and him and my family and trees and streams in the woods. I want his face I want his burning eyes to penetrate my broken heart. I don't even want him to put me back together again. It feels too good to be broken. I'm not even asking God to put me back together. I'm saying thank you that I went through the pain. Thank you that I went through the struggle. Thank you for every sleepless night that caused me to depend on you instead of man. God rescues us by breaking us. I remember talking with Mike. He said, man, he said, I went through this thing again with my knee. And he said, if I would have known what it was going to do between me and God, I'd go through it all over again. If I'd have known how close to Jesus I was going to be on the other side of this, I'd go through it all over again. I'm telling you, God has never walked me through anything that I got to the other side and said, why'd you do that? Every time you get to the other side, if you don't quit in the middle, you'll come out on the other side and you'll say, thank you, God, that you loved me enough not to leave me the way I was. There's pain in here and there's disappointment in here and there's betrayal in here. But I'm telling you, if you can see it right, it'll push you to a place you never dreamed you could go. You'll find that cross. You'll find companionship in wooden beams stained with blood. And you'll find out Jesus is trying to teach us. I know the kiss of betrayal too. Surely he has carried our grief and borne our sorrow. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of his peace. When Jesus leaves the earth, he says, my peace I give to you. 
Not peace as the world gives. My peace. He didn't leave you with peace. He left you with his peace. Peace that could stand at the whipping post and never lose heart. Peace that could endure the kiss of Judah's lips and never lose heart. Peace that could say, even if they wrap me in grave clothes and assume that I'm dead, I'm not finished because I have peace that surpasses all understanding. God has been taking us through the process of brokenness because there's some stuff he's trying to get in the earth and he's going to honor us by letting us participate. I'm not the source, but I can be the conduit. I can be the heaven and earth connection. I can be the agent of a dimensional interruption. God's trying to get in the earth and he's looking for ladders. God's trying to get in the earth and he's looking for ladders. He's looking for somebody that'll let him step on them. God's looking for people that'll lay down until they become bridges. Straight is the way. Narrow is the gate. And few there are that find it. I want to just release a grace today if I can. A grace that we would be willing to wait, that God would grant us endurance, and that if every decision we make in our life looks like the worst ministerial career decision we could ever make, we'll make it anyway because we are willing to go through the process. God, I don't want to do it my way. I want to do it your way. That's why daily I cry out with my voice, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Psalm 139, all of my days were written in your book. Every moment was recorded before any had ever passed. God, get me on the right page. God, get me in your will. If me being in your will means you got to separate me from people and systems, then separate me from people and systems. But I want to live in your will. I want to do this your way. I want to walk in accordance with your nature, God. I want you. I want you. I don't want church. I don't want religion. I don't want the ministry. I want you. I don't want money. I don't want success. I don't want fame. I want you. I want the real you all the time. I want you. Yahweh Almighty God, I want you. I want your breath on my neck when I lay down at night, and I want your breath in my face when I wake up in the morning. I want to know your smell. I want to know your touch. I want to know your taste. I want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. I want to know you. I don't want to know you on my terms. I don't want the easy Jesus. I want the real Jesus. I don't want the Jesus that makes me feel good. I want the Jesus that makes me change. I want you. I want you. I want to go through the process. I want to wait in the river. I'm tired of not flying straight. I want to get in the river. I want to get in the river. I want to get in the river until I can stay straight. I want to get in the river until I can maintain course. I'm sick of being a poser. I'm tired of being an imposter. I'm tired of coming into a service and waving my hands around and sha la la when I know that I haven't been pursuing you at home. I'm tired of sticking my Bible under my arm and walking into church like I really have a relationship with you when you've really been so distanced from me I wouldn't know you if you did walk in the room. I want the real thing. I'm tired of playing games. I've shared this so many times in different places around the country, but when Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he calls them in in, in harmony with John, hypocrites. The word is a Greek word is hypocrites. It's a dramatic term that comes from a person who plays in a drama, plays more than one role in a drama and puts on a mask so they can play multiple roles. It's a dramatic term. When he says you hypocrite, he's saying you're the kind of person that carries another mask. I never considered myself a hypocrite until I understood what it meant. And then I said, oh yes, I do have another mask. Yeah, I got another mask. I can flip that thing on right before I step in the pulpit. I can flip. And God took me through a process of crushing. God wants oil out of you. And oil is a secondary consequence of pressure. So he crushes the olive. Not because he's mad at the olive, but because he knows there's something more in you if you can stand the pressure. The crushing of the grape is what produces the savory flavor of the wine. 
But somebody's got to be willing to go through the process. And it's in the river where he lays on us. It's in the river where he tweaks us. It's in the glory of God, in the deep place of his presence, that he begins to deal with agendas. He begins to deal with egos. He begins to deal with pride. He begins to deal with every dream that's not his dream when we are willing to wait in the river. We've been singing a song. For the last month now, I guess, maybe even a little longer, we wait for you. We wait for you to walk in the room. Here we are, standing in your presence. Shekinah glory come down. Here we are, standing. But the key to the song is would somebody be willing to wait? We haven't sung that song yet without it putting it on a loop. Because some things don't happen in five minutes. Somebody's got to go through the process. There are people in here, you have an incredible anointing on your life to preach, but until you learn to serve something like this movement, you'll never make it. I don't care how called you are. I don't care how anointed you are. I don't even care how talented you are. If you don't go through the process of serving what belongs to another man, you'll never be qualified to have your own. That's why some of you have hopped from place to 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 place. place. And you'll live in that transient state. Never being rooted, never being grounded because you're not willing to go through the process of being established. God wants to establish you. He wants to discipline you. He loves you too much to leave you alone. You're not ready or you'd be there. Trust me, God has a shortage in this nation of broken vessels. If you were there, you'd be being used. You're not there yet. You can either get mad about that or you can get in that waiting. You can live in that river. You can waterlog. Just stay. Just soak. God, I wonder. I wonder where we'd be in the nation if we had broken leaders. Man, I wonder. I wonder what the state of the American church would be if we could replace for one day talent with brokenness. Where, where could we go, the American church, if for one Sunday morning we could take everybody that had talent, sit them down, and for that day use somebody that was broken? You know what excites me about that? That's how fast I think this thing can turn around. I'm watching God sit talent down. Because he is hungry to meet the needs of the people who need something to flow through their man of God, need something to flow through the woman of God, need something to flow through the worship leader, need something to flow through the children's pastor, need something to flow through the youth pastor. If you want to know what moves the heart of the people, watch Christian TV. If you want to know what moves the heart of God, find the cross. Live in the place of broken. You know that song, We Wait For You? You can play it. Go up there, just y'all too. Go up there. Let me pray for you before you go up there. Hallelujah. 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 I pray for an authentic expression of who you are in God. I pray that every shell and every mask would be cast off of you by the grace of Almighty God and you would just pour who you really are into the earth. Your sound, even when it doesn't sound exactly the way you want it to sound, you're going to release that authentic sound. That sound that heaven has heard in the bedroom is going to be the sound that heaven's going to use in the church. The sound that heaven has heard in your bedroom will be the sound that heaven will use in the church. In the name of Jesus, as a father in this faith, I give you permission to be authentic, to be genuine, to be real, to give God the fullness of what his heart desires to see through you. I make declaration over you today that every distraction is broken off of you in the name of Jesus. 
And I make declaration over you that you have clarity of thought, clarity of direction. I declare over you that every pipe dream that's not heaven's for you is cast aside and your desire begins to see people affected by the river and nature of Almighty God. I release the grace to you to cast aside every mask, every idea of the image you should portray because of the role that you're in. And I declare you're real. I declare there are moments that your weeping will not let you stay behind those keys. I declare there are moments where God flows through you in such a way that you know you're more beneficial in the floor than you are standing upright. And in those moments, I release a grace in you to be willing to take the risk of people not understanding what God's doing deep in your soul. Mighty name of Jesus. Just go ahead and go up. Oh, hallelujah. It's not really fair to pray for people like that and then ask them to go up. But if there's anything we're going to have to learn to do, and I've been praying this for several days now. You'll like this, Brad. If there's anything we're going to have to learn to do, it's going to be to learn to yield. God craves yieldedness. Will you slow down and get in the water? I was recently in a meeting, and I was praying. It was a meeting that's kind of like this, the church where you can see a, a mark all along the top of the wall, and God said, I'm showing you the water mark. He said, I'm showing you the water mark, and I'm telling you the water's rising. And I began to pray like I did that day in North Carolina. God turned the tide. I said, God, raise the water level. God, raise the water level. God said, I'm not raising the water level. I said, you just showed me the water level going up. What do you mean you're not raising the water level? He said, that's not how I don't raise the water level. He said, if you want the water level higher, tell more people to get in. If we want more of the river of God, then we need somebody to get in and cause this thing to rise. Somebody get off the banks. Somebody quit playing religion. Somebody quit doing church stuff. And somebody get in the river. Somebody get in the flow. I'm going to just take a few minutes. I know it's cruising toward lunchtime. God, give us grace to endure. Give us grace, God, to pray when we don't feel like praying, to pray when we don't feel anything, to pray when it looks like nothing's changing, to pray when we're tired, to pray when we don't feel our best, to to pray when people are talking about us, to pray when people are lying about us, to pray when we're offended, God, just to pray. It's to pray, to pray when we're on top of the world and to pray when we're fighting to claw our way up from the bottom. Teach us to pray. God, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to endure in the secret place. God, give us a favor and a grace on our lives to stay consistent in the place of seeking. And God, as hundreds of more people come funneling into this building tonight, give us a grace to release the seeker's blessing in this place, the blessing to seek you day and night all the days of our lives. God, before you ever make us a preacher, make us a seeker. God, before you ever make us a singer, make us a seeker. We want to seek you. We want to know you. Would you come, God? We'll wait. We'll endure. We'll pursue. We long for you. You are the journey that's worth every step. You are the treasure hidden in the field. We wait for you. We wait for you. We wait for you. We wait.
I wait for you. God, give her grace to wait. I wait for you. This is our lifestyle from this day forward, God. Seekers. I wait for you. Come in this room. We wait for you. Let's find that place right now. Find that place right now where you come back to that real brokenness. Come on, find that place again. Find the feet of that cross where God moves you into his intention for you. I wait for you. Come like the rain, God. Come like the rain. Like the crops cry for rain, God, we cry for you. And I wait for you. Walk in this room. I wait. at the altar I just release you to do that God you rescue us by breaking us I'm tired of being Jacob I'm tired of being trickster I'm tired of this mask God I want to become your intention for me God bless us by breaking us Saturday for you, God. We need you. I wait on you. We need your hand to be upon us, God. We need your grace to be upon us, God. We crave intimacy in this place today, Lord.
Just the keys, just the keys. Come on, he wants to hear you. He wants to hear the cry of your heart today. I'm coming back, God. I'm going to meet you there again. Come on, I'm picking up where I left off last night. I'm going to live with that first altar. I'm going to go back to that place where my tent was in the beginning. And I'm going to burn day and night. I'm going to burn day and night. It's you I long for, God. My spirit craves you. I want to get lost again. God, I want to find that place where time slips away. Oh, God, we want to find that place where nothing is relevant but you. Grace to wait. Grace to stay the course. Grace to fast, God. To fast because we want to be hungry. To fast because we're tired of what this world offers. We want you. We want the real thing. Grace to wait, grace to stay, grace to endure. God, give us brokenness. God, find a people you can pour through. Find a people that you can invest in and know that we'll not harbor it for ourselves, God, but we'll release what you're pouring into us. First verse, I will search. And I will search all through the night. Yeah. Yes, I will. 
rejected and we've rejected and we've rejected how many invitations have you extended to bring us into a deeper place of devotion and we have put it off and said yeah I'll do that God and yeah I'll do that but we never really step up and live the devoted life we say today we accept this grace we will not waste the grace that you're releasing into this place today we're going to live this life we're going to seek day and night when we get distracted when we get off course I declare we quickly recover I declare that we make aggressive adjustments when necessary God we don't want to lose what we've got with you God the the ground that we've gained by your grace we don't want to lose an inch of it. The depth of the work you're doing in my heart, God, I don't want to lose a bit of it. The jealousy that I see you displaying over my affections, God, I don't want it to wane. Stay jealous for my affections. God, guard me against getting distracted by other lovers. God, I give you the permission to stay jealous for my heart. Stay jealous for my heart. I agree with the psalmist. Don't relent until you have it all. God, don't relent until you have it all. I'm tired of giving you just enough to get by. I want you to have it all. I want you to have me. I want you to own me. 
I want to live as if I'm bought with a price. My obsession is you. My obsession is your presence. This movement that you are stirring and initiating in this city, it's a presence movement. It's a place for the glory to dwell. It's a habitation. God, we yield to your initiative here and we say yes to building a place for your glory. Yes to building a people that will inherit keys that open doors that no man can close. We say yes to you, God. We say yes. With reverence and even fear and awe and respect, we say yes. We say yes and then we say, God, help us to say yes. (laughs) We say we'll do it and then we say, God, but you're going to have to help us do it. We're going to yield to your help. We're going to receive and accept your grace. God, I pray that your eyes would penetrate the greater Columbus area and find every broken leader and elevate them for this city's sake. God, find every broken leader. Find every broken pastor. Find every man that's been through the school of brokenness and come out without ego or agenda and elevate those men in this city. Elevate those men in this city that love their wives. Elevate those men in this city that love their God more than they love ministry. Elevate the men and the women of this city. Elevate every worship leader, God, that's come through brokenness and arrived on the other side, ready to be all you've designed for them to be, God. Raise up presence churches in this city. Raise up presence glory-driven ministries in this city. God, I pray for a strengthening of the local church here. God, I pray for the spirit of religion, for the betrayal, for the game playing that's gone on in this city, for the division to be broken down by a true outpouring of your glory and grace coming in Jesus' name. Columbus, your fields will sing with the grace of God again. In Jesus' name, your fields will sing again. I say over you, city of Columbus, you will become all that heaven has intended for you to be. I see cars parked in your fields. I see fires burning in your woods. I see the glory of God resting upon this city again. Your fields will sing again, Columbus. Your fields will sing again, households, with the burning lamps of family devotion. I declare a stoking of the fire of family altars. God, release a movement among the men of this city to turn and to return to heaven's intention for their life. God, raise up men of integrity. God, raise up people of character. God, raise up people without agenda, without self-motivation. Raise up kingdom-driven men and women to lead this city back to heaven's design in Jesus' name. God, go into the private chambers of professors. Shake them out of their humanism and give them an encounter with the real God. Whoo, God. Whoo. That this city will not revolve around the buckeye, but the burning eye. Will revolve around the burning, fiery eyes of God. A city that will live to please God. A city that will live to please God. Break down the idolatry of materialism in this city. And God, release people into the burning understanding that you are the chief end of man. To glorify God and to enjoy you forever. This is our intent. To glorify God and to enjoy you forever. God, give this city the grace of a fresh encounter. 
I prophesy these things into this atmosphere. I release them into this faith. I declare the portal is open and these words do not hit ceilings of brass, but they penetrate into the dimensions of authority and they're released like rain into the earth. Today we leverage the future of a city. Today the future of a city is being leveraged by the prayers of Jacob as he steps into his Israel nature in Jesus' name. Rearrange us, shake us, inconvenience us, use us, God. Take us to a secret place. Take us beyond the veil. Take us beyond the facade. Take us beyond the state of the imposter. God, we want to be real. We want to be genuine. We want to be authentic seekers of God. We want to really be born again. We want to live in our new creation status. Let us be signs and wonders to be reckoned with in the earth. Broken men, broken women, broken teenagers, broken children that say, I have found a place at the feet of Jesus. The cross has become the companion of my soul and I choose to live in the river of God's mercy. Father, I bless and I agree with the life of every patriarch that stood in this city. I'm going back to roots in my spirit of the 60s and the early 70s where there was a stirring of a movement in this city. And I, 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 none, none of this I, is just what, it's just what I see by the Spirit. I go back to the roots of the late 60s and the early 70s where there was a stirring of something happening in this city. I even see the, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association had a great impact on this area. And I begin to call forth the roots of those revivals of charismatic renewal. I begin to call that forth in this city again. I declare that nothing that has happened between then and now is significant enough to forfeit the roots and the roots of men and women of integrity and character crying out for a move of God that would shake the poorest of the poor in this region, that would go into the neighborhoods that desperately needed the wave and the move of the Spirit of God. I pray for inner city explosions. I pray for breakouts, God, in every hood, in every ghetto. I pray for an explosion of your Spirit to come. Rock the African American Church of Columbus. God, I pray for the next generation to begin to hunger for the things of God. I pray for sons and daughters to rise around real fathers in Jesus name. God do the real thing here. Do the deep thing here and let the root bring forth her fruit even though it's been delayed it's not over and the root is going to produce her fruit. The seed was woo, incorruptible. The seed of those early days was incorruptible seed. It cannot be forfeited. It cannot be denied. I call you forth. The fruit of early days, I call you forth. Fruit of charismatic renewal, I call you forth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My brother, I know I don't know you, but can I pray over you? I feel that the Father just would have me to agree with a heaven's assessment that you're a father in this city and that God is going to begin to surround you with young men, that you're not going to have to worry about them dividing you. You're not going to have to worry about them trying to take from you, but they're going to rally around you. They're going to call you a father, and you're going to begin to lead them into the deep things that you've hungered for, for you've stood as a standard for revival, for the moving of the Spirit of God, for the outpouring of God. And I declare that God is affirming you as a, in a, as a witness today, as a witness for heaven today, that all that God has whispered in your ear will come to pass, that it is not too late for you to see the fulfillment of heaven's desire and intention. I call forth the young lions that will surround you, that will roar at your command. God has given you a grace to reproduce 
the DNA of heaven in the earth. And I declare that there is an explosion of purpose coming to you in the days to come. We agree that the glory of your latter house will be greater than the glory of your former house. That you don't have to settle. You don't have to maintain. You don't have to sustain. But a fresh wind is coming to an old friend today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Whoa.